our show at 6.30. And I welcome you all and call this meeting to order. The Board of Directors, Wednesday, June the 7th, 2023. Welcome to all of you uh, spectators. We've never had, we haven't had a full house for a long time. So uh, uh, is, are there any additional agenda items? Seeing none, we'll move on. Uh, is there anyone as a declaration of conflict of interest? Seeing none, then we will go to our next point, and that is a delegation of the Turkey Point Mountain Bike Club and Sherry Shira. I'm, I'm, sounds that right? Yes, you did. Okay. You want to come up front and maybe give us your presentation? Thank you. Yeah, just turn it on. Need to use it in here. This one, maybe. Okay, everyone, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's gonna move a little closer here. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Before I get started, I want to thank all of you for letting us be part of your agenda uh, this evening. I also want to rec recognize the representatives in the room from our Trip to a Mountain Bike Club, as well as our friends from the Dirt Runners Group and Brandon Sloan for taking time on this busy schedule for being with us. I know we have a small window of time, so out of respect, I'm going to stick closely to my notes so that we can get, I don't get off on a tangent and start telling you random stories about mountain biking. <laughs> so our objective this evening is to share some information about our club, discuss how we can work together, discuss the renewal of our MOU, and of course, to answer any questions that you might have. So before we look at who we are, let's first look at who we are not. If this is what comes to mind when you think of mountain bikers, you'll be happy to know that this is not something you would commonly see on our trails, although I wish I could do that on my bike. This is definitely not us. We pick up litter if we see it, but I'm happy to report to you that it's actually not a common thing for us to see much garbage on our trails. As for wildlife, we love to see animals and birds in the woods, and we may stop on occasion to look at them, but we never approach them, we never get close to them, and we never let them ride our bicycles. <laughs> so who is the Turkey Pump Mountain Bike Club? We are a nonprofit organization established in 2011. We're the largest club in Norfolk County. We're a group of individuals who love nature and being outdoors. I learned something new when putting together this PowerPoint. A biophilia hypothesis suggests that humans possess an innate tendency to seek connections to nature. I guess you could say that we are biophiliacs. We have such a wide range of members. We have families that ride together, people from our, people from our community, as well as many visitors, some that come from quite afar, individuals from a wide range of professions. Often, them are often many of them are waiting to retire so they can ride more. And of course, we have seasoned riders, but also new riders eager to improve their skills and endurance. Year round, we have a whole lot of good people who use our trails. Spring, summer, winter, and fall. These are the people most commonly seen on our trails. Near and dear to my heart is our ladies group, which we started 10 years ago when there were very few female riders. Women now make up a third of our membership. We also have a little rippers group with children, which is a great way to get kids out in nature and hopefully create a lifelong love of cycling. Members pay an annual fee, and although our numbers fluctuate, we typically have between four to 600 paid members. You might be surprised to know that our average age is 46. We have riders that travel to us from very far away, and many of them make substantial donations. We have a $5 million insurance coverage. We work to a $15,000 budget annually, and the club owns $20,000 in maintenance equipment and infrastructure. This map shows the members we have in various areas spanning from London to Toronto to Port Colborne and beyond. We work under the guidance of IMBA, which stands for International Mountain Bike Association. They help us follow the best environmental practices around trail building with care taken to prevent erosion and help 
minimize the footprint and human impact on our trails. Our trails have typically have an 18 inch tread, which is perfect for the types of fitness and recreation that they're made to accommodate. We not only make trails, we care for all the trails that we've been given the privilege to use. An example of this is seeing members cleaning up debris after a windstorm so they can maintain safety on the trails and get back to enjoying them. We have informative pamphlets, which include a map for guidance, and we have trail uh, maps, we have at the junctions, we have maps and we have trailhead signs indicating the length of the trail, the level of difficulty, and the fun name that each trail has earned. So other than mountain bikers, who do we serve? We happily share the trails with runners, hikers, dog walkers, and bird watchers, and they love the trails as much as we do. We've asked ourselves this question, what is the value of this trail network? Beyond mountain biking, there are so many reasons why these trails are invaluable. They allow access to invasive species to aid in control. They encourage tourism in the area. They support local businesses. They get people out in nature. They encourage exercise and a healthy lifestyle. They greatly support mental health. This is a quote that I, I heard several years ago from one of our riders that has stuck with me. I am not sure how I could go to work every day if I didn't have these trails to escape to a couple times a week to remind myself of what's important in life. We are so proud of the 93 kilometers of beautiful, well-maintained recreation trails that fit within the requirements of FSC for balancing ecology and community. Our trail network is known across the province and attracts riders year round. We know that government bodies do not receive enough funding to be able to maintain a trail network as significant as this. Our club is able to maintain it within the budget and it allows us to support your goal as stated in your strategic plan to connect people with nature. Many of us have traveled to other trail networks over the years and we know that all mountain bikes networks are generally designed similarly. Most regions are becoming increasingly more aware of the benefits of having a network like this in their area. For example, Simcoe County has added 90 kilometers of new trails in the last five years due to popularity and value to the area. Many trail networks have greater density than Turkey Coat Mountain Bike Club does. For example, on your Anderson track, we have one kilometer for 11.4 acres of land. Christie Lake, there's one kilometer for seven acres, and in Hilton Falls, there's one kilometer for six acres. Turkey Point has trails on 190, 189 acres of LPRCA land. 35 of the 189 acres is designated as natural heritage. This area will benefit from trail activities such as cycling, walking, and running. When we are on the trails, we want to be surrounded by nature. We don't want so many trails that we see others going beside us. A lot of thought and consideration goes into trail design. We need enough trail length to be able to accommodate all riding levels, beginner to experienced, to achieve connectivity for safety and convenience, to maintain an interesting and fun trail network that doesn't become boring and keeps people riding locally and attracts out of towners, to easily accommodate closures when scheduled or necessary, to spread riders out and give them enough room to ensure safety and avoid bottlenecks, to have enough room for different types of users to share the trails, to have multiple access points to spread out parking areas and avoid overloading any one area as well as allow for emergency access, and to encourage users to stay on the designated trail and not create any unsanctioned or unofficial trail routes. We work hard with and have great relationship with several different landowners. Jeff Pickersgill, the park superintendent said this, the Turkey Boat Mountain Bike Club currently maintains countless mountain bike trails within Turkey Point Provincial Park and St. Williams Conservation Reserve under an MOU with the ministry. The TPMBC is engaged with ministry staff on an ongoing basis regarding trail maintenance and responds timely to concerns and requests for information. We know that we're good partners, but we also know 
that there has been a setback in our relationship with the LPRCA. We want to get back on track and look to the future. How do we get back on track? First and foremost, we want to apologize formally for the previous misunderstanding regarding trail development on LPRCA land. In addition, we want to find concrete ways to communicate effectively with a clear understanding that no changes are to be made to any trails without your formal approval. To commit to assisting with control of invasive species utilizing the large number of volunteers that we have. We'd like to request the opportunity to walk the trails with you to find ways to maintain the integrity of the current trail network while making whatever adjustments are required to meet your needs. And we want to sign an updated MOU with you that not only meets the need of both parties, but creates a new partnership that we can all be proud of. We sincerely believe that the LPRCA and TPNBC working together is something we can all be proud of and is the best possible way to use this land wisely and protect it for many years to come. We look forward to working with you. Thank you. I'll answer any questions that you might have. Yes, Doug. I'll start, Mr. Chairman. I guess I, I'm a little unclear, if I may, to Sherry. What, like, you, you mentioned in your, your presentation there about the other uh, parks or, or lands that you occupy or, or use. Can you just clarify that for me? I know the LPRCA land, but what other ones? You mentioned the provincial park and... So we're on uh, Norfolk County land. We are on the uh, Ryersey Church property. We are on Lost Lake Adventure property. Um, we're just looking for our MOU. Let's see which. Uh, um, <laughs> you found it quicker than me. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Turkey Point Provincial Park, St. Williams Conservation Reserve, the Maybe Cabin, Long Point Eco Adventures, the Bernie Kill Winery, um, and uh, we have some property on some private land, and the United Church of Canada, that's what I was trying to think of, and um, yeah, Norfolk County, and then the LPRCA. And you have agreements with all of the parties? We have MOUs with all of them that are currently signed. We have uh, the one that we're working on with you, and then we have one renewing with Norfolk County. That we're just renewing with them. So, but other than that, they're all, and we've had MOUs with all of them in the past. And my, I guess my last question is, I, and you mentioned you have the insurance, and have you had any problems in the in the past in terms of insurance problems? In terms of I don't think we've had any problems. I don't know if our our um, chair or um, we haven't right, Claude had no. There's, there's been no no problem with that. All the no. insurance has been no. Claims. No, no claims or anything whatsoever. Uh, Doug, I was on the executive for uh, 10 years. I haven't been on it for the last year, so I wasn't sure if there was anything that happened um, at that time, but I, think I hadn't heard anything, so I didn't think there was. So, Thank you. You're welcome. I just want to interrupt for a second. Uh, as a reminder, this meeting is being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel at a later date. I forgot to announce at the beginning, so done now. Any, any further questions for Sherry? Seeing none, I thank you very much for your presentation, and we will be in touch. Okay, thank you for your time. Excuse me. Can I just have a moment? Um, That's my bad. I forgot that Claude was going like to present uh, We have the Turkey Point Mountain Bike Club, uh, the executive and all its members, Judy, and to present uh, the LPRC with a $2,000 check for help with uh, invasive species mitigation. Great, that's uh, that, that's that's yeah, thank you. Hey, you're welcome. My name is Bob McCurry. I'm president this year. Oh, okay. And also, uh, we had an executive meeting the other night. We'd like to offer you another thousand dollar check as well. This one, this one comes with a condition. <laughs> <laughs> the condition is uh, when you um, need help, when you need help out there on your land, please call us. We have a large group of volunteers. A lot of them are here in, in the audience. And these are things that we do. We have work days with other our, uh, land owners that we have. Um, we'd love to help you whenever you need it. Please call. Okay, great. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the board, on behalf of the board, I'd like to thank you very much for your donations. Appreciate it. We can always use a little extra cash, <laughs> just like most organizations. So we will now carry on with our agenda. And that is that uh, I have a motion here that the LPRCA Board of Directors receives a presentation from the Turkey Point Mountain Bike Club as information. I need a mover and second, like Tom and Peter. Are there, is there any further discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. Those in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll carry on with our agenda. I have a motion here that the minutes of the LPRCA Board of Directors meeting held May 33rd, 2023 be adopted as circulated. Is there any discussion today? No discussion. Moved. You're moving it. Seconder. Raining. Thank you. And is there any discussion of this? These minutes, any, any additions or deletions or corrections? Seeing none, vote in favor. That's carried. <clears throat> there is no business arising from the previous minutes. So now we're going to go to number seven. And I have a motion uh, that the minutes of the Lee Brown March Management Committee meeting held December 16th, 2022, be adopted as circulated. Can I have a mover and a seconder? The mic, seconder, two. Any further discussion? Seeing none, those in favor? That's carried. <laughs> Then I have a second uh, off the motion that the draft minutes of the Audit and Finance Committee meeting held May 19th, 2023, be adopted as circulated. Any discussion? Mover and a seconder. Rainey and Chris. Thank you. Those in favor. That's carried. Correspondence, there is none. Then we have next on the agenda number nine, mm -hmm. 24 section 28 regulations approved permits. And I'll ask Leanne to speak to that. Great, thank you. Through the chair, LPRCA staff have approved 24 applications for development since the May for the director's meeting. Their attached report summarizes the location and the nature of each application. And then on page 41 of your agenda, there is a map. Um, when we're in our watershed the application this report has been provided for your information and if you have any questions are there any questions for me regarding these applications her department's been very busy mm -hmm. yes. yes Peter. thank you mr chair for you um leanne how does this come out last year in terms of permit numbers <laughs> Thank you through the chair. Uh, and I believe Judy will answer that in her DM report. It's going to be it's down a little bit, I guess. It's um we had 63 this year versus 71 last year in the permits. Um but then we had quite a few um finding act applications. I think those numbers are up, so there's always that all the flow to the different. Focus. Any further questions for Leanne? Okay, then I have a motion that the LPRCA Board of Directors receives a Section 28 regulation to put permits. Permits report dated June 7th, 2023, as information. I have a mover and second here. Rainey? No, sorry. Sorry, Shelly Ann. And Peter. Any further discussion? Seeing none, those in favor? 
That's Gary. So next we have the general manager's report for May 2023. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So in the report, we touched on the permit numbers already. Um, we did have a kickoff meeting on the environmental assessment of the Victoria Dam with Matrix Solutions and Norfolk County staff, so your staff also attended. Um, there is a meeting at Norfolk County office, and then they um, moved to actually the site um, to finish off the meeting. Uh, we have replaced the pool house roof at Bacchus. That was part of the um, approved budget. And that came in a little bit under budget at $8,400. Um, Sarah Pointer has accepted the curator position, which we're pretty excited because that position has been vacant um, since Helen didn't return. Um, Helen Barton, who had been the curator for the past few years um, in January. So it was nice to have um, that position built. We are continuing to spray the invasives and um, we are securing some more funding this year um, in the programs that we're involved in, the partner programs, and we're getting uh, 10,000 more dollars. So that will take the budget from 32,000, which was in the budget to 42,000. Um, and I also, Later in the report, we are receiving additional funding, um, but it can be used on invasive or cover crop programs and our and our erosion control programs. So um, that's Paul Gagnon's area, and his budget is moving up by twenty thousand dollars to one hundred one thousand. So that was um, very good news for us. And our tree planting program probably has is the latest, is the lowest it has ever been since I've been here. Um, we ended up only putting 29,150 trees in the ground. And when the report came to the board in January for the tree stock, I think in February, it was for 42,000 what we were projecting, but we did have some landowners uh, cancel and we did have some supply um, orders that were not filled. So combination of things, um, but we were still able to get um, that's still quite a few trees, but it's just not as many as we're used to seeing. So that's all I have. Thank you. Are there any questions for Judy? Yes. Dave? Through you, Mr. Chairman, to Judy, uh, you talked about the uh, curator position. The individual that uh, accepted the position, is that an internal posting or an internal advancement, or is this an outsider? Um, I'm not the, familiar with the names. But... Yeah, so this, this um, person came was she was doing her master's at Western. Mm -hmm. um, she, I think, did her education in Alberta and had worked for some museums there. And then she had some placements in, in London. So she's actually living in London mm -hmm. and she just finished her master's. Very well, so, thank you. Peter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to Judy. Judy, you talked about the uh, invasive species budget uh, being increased up to 42000 for this yeah. year. Um, are you satisfied with that level of funding? Are we able to uh, get after all the species and all the tracks that we want to? Or um, in a perfect world, what would that budget look like? Um, through the chair to Peter, um, that would be a very large number. We have... Um, we have a lot of invasive species, and I don't, I can't recall exactly the percentage that we have um, targeted to spray. But yeah, we have a large number that we really just started with getting some funding last year. Um, we started the mapping the year before, and then we started to um, continue the map because it's, we go in and survey the properties to see what's in there, and then we go in. Uh, and this funding pays for our staff time and the um, part of our staff time and the products. So we would, yeah, it would take a lot of money to do it completely, but it's pretty encouraging. There's um, other opportunities. We did have a meeting today uh, with another organization that's looking to support our initiatives. So potentially might be able to secure another possibly $50,000 this year. So so we don't have the um, manpower in-house, but they would allow for contracting, like we could hire contractors and also possibly money to help do more 
on the ground mapping and monitoring. So that was very good. So yeah, there's a lot of initiatives right now to help um, deal with these kind of things. So mm -hmm. follow up. Yes. So the invasive species that you're targeting then, is it mostly phragmites or is there some insect species as well, like the gypsy moth or um no, this is all um plant based, like so it would be um multiflora rose, um garlic mustard, all of them. Yeah, the what others did I speak uh, up? Yeah, sorry. Buckthorn, um autumn olive. Multiflora rose, all garlic mustard, yeah, a variety of like brown, some things brown um, we're using. We use the product Roundup, and then also some things that are bigger and woodier, like more like trees, um, that take garlic, right? So it's uh, different treatment, different chemicals, but yeah. Thank you. Any other further questions, uh, Raymond? Yes, thank you for you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick question in regards to staffing, summer staff. Um, how are we looking this year? I know in the past you've struggled to build your parks. So how are we doing? Um, we, uh, through the chair, um, we are better than we were last year. Um, we recently had a couple resignations. Um, so we have had to repost for a supervisor at Bacchus and an assistant at Holtman. Um, It continues to be a bit of a challenge. We don't have every position um, built. But uh, we definitely are in better shape than we were last year. So, thank you. Any further questions? Yes. Yes. Good thing, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on the tree planting, uh, you say you have a bunch of cancellations or with the deferral where they'll get to them next year. Uh, is there ever a year not to plant them? I mean, this spring was a good year not to plant them. <laughs> Um, for the chair, yes, if you had a crystal ball and knew how dry it was going to be, you're probably very lucky to plant trees. Um, there'll be a lot of probably re replantings uh, for the survivals. But I think some of the private land owners just didn't get the land prep um, to get the trees planted. So they're potentially they would be customers next year for sure. Any further questions? Seeing none, I have a motion. The LPRCA Board of Directors received a general manager's report for May 2023 as information. I have a move and a second. Rainey and Chris. Any further discussion? Seeing none, those in favor. That's Gary. So next we have on the agenda the uh, 10B costs, apportioning agreements for category three programs and services. And you have to do that as well? I am. Thank you, okay. Mr. Chair. So there's a lot of information here. So I thought, well, I'll just try to approach it, um, give you some um, high level information. And so in the report, we sort of outlined, because for some people um, sitting around the table, this started before your term. So some people are playing to jump on where we're at with, with the um, regulations that came into effect. So in the report, we have our programs and services inventory um, attached. And we also have a draft cost apportionment agreement that we have reviewed with one municipality so far, and that was Norfolk County. We thought we'd start with the largest. If they had any comments or feedback, then we, you know, we did um, have that meeting. We did get some comments, we made some changes. So we thought if we start with them and then we'll um, go out and work with the other municipalities, um, senior staff, and then the idea is it has to be approved by council. So then um, I think in Norfolk County's case, it would be the CAO or Brandon Sloan that would take it to council for approval um, and that would have to happen at each each table, council table. So we need to have these agreements in place by early fall. And if we don't have them in place, or we anticipate we're not gonna be able to achieve that, um, have them in place by January 1st, 2024, like signed and ratified, we have to get an extension from any MNRF now. Um, 
and we have to get that extension filed for that by October 1st. I <coughs> hope that we don't have to do that, that we can have things at least in the works and then if they can be signed in the new year, um, for the new year, that would be great. So I'm just gonna give you some details um, about what, what's in front of you. So as I said, under one regulation, um, Ontario Regulation 687, it came to into effect October 1st, 2021. And we had to uh, have a transition plan. And then this was approved by our board of directors on December 1st, 2021. We circulated that to all the member municipalities um, in December of 2021. And also as part of that transition plan and that regulation, there's also compliance reporting quarterly to the minister um, and the final report on that transition plan is October 1st, 2023. So this has been going on since 2021. So the inventory of programs and services uh, was required and it was approved by the board of directors in February 23, 2022. And then it was circulated out to all the municipalities after that. So based on the feedback, from MECP, there was a few minor edits and they were made July 1st, 2020, 2022 in a progress report. Um, so, catching up here. So what we've done now is from that time in 2022, we've had the 2023 budget. So we've gone back and allocated the cost against the programs and services listing to, to reflect the 2023 budget. So what you have in the package is actually that report that's been updated with those, those costs. So the, um, so I guess we're not proposing like when we positioned this with Norfolk County, um, we're not proposing any new programs and services. Um, it's sort of like status quo would be for our services and programs. And um, we will have to do the budget as we've always done. And we would do the budget for 2024 starting out this fall. But the only real difference is that we have some programs and services that under the new regulation, we cannot levy the municipality for. We only can um, collect levy if we have an agreement. And for us, we have three areas um, under the category three, which we can touch on here shortly. Um, but the cost would be apportioned the same as we do in our budget. So it's really having the budget and then we're gonna cargo this amount of 168,000 invoice it separate and we would still invoice the municipalities for all the other levy um, as we have in the past. So it's it's really pulling out of our budget process. Well, we'll do the budget, but it's just separating the invoicing to the municipality um, because we cannot, if we use levy on category three item, um, we have to have an agreement. We can't just say, you know, Grant County, we need to pay us this, we have the power to levy you. We still have the power to levy, but only on category one items. So that's really what the change is. So if you go to the category, um, the inventory on page 47, When I said we're not doing any new programs and services, there are five new things we have to do under the regulations, but those are reports um, and plans. And those um, are under the regulation. We don't have a choice and they have to be completed by December 31st, 2024. And as you go through there, you'll see, we have to determine how much it's gonna cost to do those. And that would be the TV, TVVs. And those programs um, or plans that we have to do, there's six of them. We have to do an operational plan um, and an asset management plan for the dams. We have to do an ice management plan for two areas, the Big Otter for Port Burwell and the Sandusky in the 
Alderman County. Uh, we also have to deal with watershed uh, resource management strategy, a conservation area strategy, and a land inventory. So mm -hmm. if you go to the bottom of page um, page three, well, I guess it's the gender package number 49. It's highlighted in yellow. This is the um, first category three that we required an agreement on. And this is private land stewardship administration. So what this is really staff time to apply for and manage the external funding and promote the stewardship activity that we do and also provide in technical support to property owners. Um, also in this category is the administration delivery of any real uh, water quality and clean water programs. Um, where we work with municipalities on. So that is um, 11968 and that's really covering wages so that we can continue to get um, funding. The funding is opening up more that it will cover wages, but not all programs allow you to charge wages back to, to grants and funding that we receive. So then if you flip to the next page, the next category is, um, we're calling it stream health monitoring. And the value here is 18,924. And these numbers are, what we did was we took the, the budget and we modeled it to this program and services. And these are the numbers that we came up with based on the 2023 budget. So this area is, um, Staff time to do water temperature monitoring in cold water streams, our benthics and vertebrate sampling and analysis, and reporting on the water quality conditions in the watershed report card, for example. The data is also used when we're looking at the dam operations, low water response, and also there's some use in the permitting side of things. So um, this is mainly staff time. Um, <laughs> The thing with these, our staff, um, we got the question like, are these discretionary costs? And really not because we're assuming everything runs is gonna be, we're gonna continue doing what we have done. We're not far off our mandate, um, the mandated services, but we don't have one person doing one job. So we have a person doing many jobs, right? So. It's a piece of a person or people or a couple of staff members, but it's so we're trying to slice it the best we can, but um, it's $18,924 still on that side. And um, so then if you turn the page to the next one on page 52, the um, category three item there is the bathhouse heritage um, village and historical services. And that overall cost is 181,859. But under agreement, we would be only asking for um, approximately 75% of that, 137,217, because we do have other funding sources um, in that program area. So again, this is really the staff time and operating cost for the Heritage Village and the grist mill. Um, staff also delivers school programs under contract with the two school boards here. And we, if we have capacity, we also do out of um, contract um, programs in the spring and fall. And this, the Heritage Village started with an acquisition back in 1956 with the Bad Coast um, family. So those are our three groups. And we don't have any capital expenditures um, for the Heritage Village in the 2023 budget. Um, there would possibly be um, cost if there's any, any um, capital initiatives that we want to do, but it'd have to be added on. Um, and we have with we're going to be determining that in the 2024 budget and beyond to see what the requirements are for the building maintenance. But um, historically, we have done some work up there. Um, 
and we we try to use donations or we have interest from the friends of Bacchus donations and we've been successful in getting some grants so we're going to continue to push that um, and look for other money to help offset the the capital expenses so that's our programs and services inventory um, And we will be submitting that on our next progress report um, for July 1st, or June 30th, I guess. Um, the, the other attachment is the actual cost apportionment agreement that we worked on. We have worked with other neighboring um, CAs. Um, Kettle Creek um, and Upper Thames we're taking a very similar approach on our categories um, two and three. Um, Grand River, we participated with them in a meeting with Norfolk County, and we're sitting in with them with Grant County tomorrow. Um, they are taking a different approach on their categories, um, but not the approach. They're putting some things in two that we have in three but they are still using the CBA method to apportion the cost. So at the end of the day, um, the outcome's the same. It's just how they're interpreting some things as being category two or, and we're interpreting them as category three. So um, that might cause some confusion, but we'll see where that goes. We can easily defend, you know, both of us can easily defend which way we're putting like the, the categories. So I don't know if you want to go through the detail. This is just, the idea with this agreement is we're looking to get a five-year agreement with the municipality. And then as each time that we do a budget, we would update Schedule A. And the feedback we had from um, the CAO at Norfolk County was, he thought possibly council would be looking for some type of cap on the cost. So we had put it would be whatever turned out from the budget, but we have updated the language in there to say that the cost would be capped to a maximum of the CPI that we use for a budgeting process, which is a 12 month trailing average. Um, so um, I was just talking to Brandon Sloan about that because he's sort of the lead at Norfolk County. Um, and then there's a couple other small things, but at the end of the meeting with Norfolk County, um, when the treasurer learned that, oh, this is just 168,000 what you're already invoicing us and, and be able to explain that um, it's really just taking our budget and then have we create an agreement for this portion. And on page um, 66 of the agenda, this shows what the amount is by each municipality. And we're taking that it's an all-in approach because to, to not have everybody participate would not make it very manageable for us because it's already very time consuming and to have one person opt in or out, we're not even going down that route. We're saying this is what we're recommending and would like as a whole for the watershed. So this schedule would be updated based on every budget. Um, so it would, you know, because your CBA changes a bit for each municipality. So as you can see, for each municipality that you represent, um, we're showing how much of the 168,000 would be your share. So um, um, I'm just looking for any feedback that you might have on um, or ideas that might make it easier to deal with the, the councils and um, we're hoping that it goes smooth. Yes. Yeah, Judy. Two or, two or three years ago, when this all started, mm -hmm. downloading onto the healthcare CAs and other CAs, uh, there was a concern about the backhouse historic area, heritage area. Yeah. And it was also a uh, concern in Toronto, Metro Toronto, 
Conservation Authority with respect to the Black Creek Pioneer Village because mm -hmm. they both run similar programs, except mm -hmm. the Black Creek is much larger than Backfield's. Mm -hmm. And at that time, there was a, a, a statement made by Doug Ford that the Black Creek Pioneer Village would still get dollars, but nothing was mentioned of the backhouse uh, thing that we're, we're working on here. So uh, do you know anything, what they're doing with, with what's Toronto doing with the, the uh, Black Creek Pioneer Village? Are they in the same conundrum as we are? Because I recall Toronto Star articles, Doug Ford said that the Black Creek Pioneer Village would continue and they'd be getting a special grant from the government to continue operating the way they did. So we as LPRCA should be getting that same grant is what I'm thinking. I'm not aware of any grant out there. Um, I did check with um, the, the um, CEO there at Toronto, but I think like I know Lower Thames, they have a, Pioneer type village outside of London. They are they're putting it as a category three and looking for the support from the municipalities as a been in the past. Um, they have just access to grant similar to what we did at Bacchus to um, basically build a new center there. But I don't know anything about the Black Creek, and I think. Um, I'm not sure that the board, like the legislation did not come out to reflect historic villages as a category one. If it had been a category one mandatory service and program, then we would just, we wouldn't have to go and get a grievance. The board would, you know, as we always done in the budget, um, review the budget and we'll continue to do that. But the, now we have to have a side agreement with municipalities for that category three item. Unless if you have a category three item, which we have lots of, and is, if you have a chance to go through and look at the programs and services, if you have other funding and you're not accessing municipal levy, you don't have to have an agreement, right? So, um, yeah. like our parks, we don't have to have an agreement because we're able to self fund that with user fees and we have the right to charge the user fees for category three. So yeah, this is, um, yeah, unfortunately it's the regulation was not designed to, to uh, protect the, the heritage historic sites. If you could check with the Toronto Conservation Authority, mm -hmm. I may still have the copy of the article that was in the Toronto Star. Okay. Or that statement. Who else do you have a question? Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in case I may have to defend this for Purple County, um, <laughs> I want to make sure I understand it. When you bring in the new budget for 2024 with a 0% increase, um, the total bill will be exactly the same as 2023, except it'll be in two parts. Is that correct? I do understand it. Any other questions? Two. Thanks, John. Uh, through John, Judy, I don't think it's going to happen, but I'll play devil's advocate. Yeah. You're saying you want some guidance or advice. Well, I'm going to ask you for some guidance. So let's say I give you a scenario. Alderman, probably 95% of the residents have never been to Bacchus or have used the facilities at back house or the school. So let's say they decide they want to opt out. They don't want to sign up for that. Who are you looking to lobby for LPRCA? The Shelly and myself, or are you guys going to lobby when you do your presentation to senior staff? Do you know where, where, where I'm coming from? So, because there has to be a sell job. Right. So, what we want to do is um, meet with the CAO, and the, there's all, already been meetings with the senior planning staff, <laughs> and some of this. Um, Leanne attended the meeting because I was away, and Niagara. Um, see it was there also so yeah ultimately we'd like to get the senior staff input obviously in support um because they would be having to bring that forward to council okay. so, so you haven't reached out 
so far, or, or that's on your agenda to, to do, like on your radar to do? Um, no, I don't have a meeting with the CAO yet. Okay. No, right. but we have had meetings with senior staff. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Yes, Robert. If I understand what you said earlier, the category three, you're lumping them all together as category three for the agreements with the municipality. Correct. So it's not going to be an agreement for the Bacchus and another agreement for the screen of its own. And it may not be devil's advocate, it may be a real scenario where uh, a municipality does not want to enter into that agreement based on perhaps one of the three. There's kind of threes. For example, Grand County has uh, a couple of, uh, they share with GRCA. Okay. They have apps mail. If the people in Arthur don't want to fund apps mail, they won't do that. So that'll flag Bacchus for Grand County. And they'll say, well, if Arthur doesn't want to fund apps, why is Grant funding Bacchus? So if Grant gets stubborn mm -hmm. and says, no, we, we're not going to sign the agreement, but the others fund it, will the others fund it? Mm -hmm. Or is Grant well, County with 7% of the, the uh, levy going to kibosh the Bacchus mm -hmm. Center because they won't fund it? Well, I would hope that the Grant County share is like 12,000. They've been supporting it. I would all the way along, but uh, but we would we would have to come back and regroup with the board to strategize if we want to possibly use reserves, which I <laughs> wouldn't be the ideal situation, but it would bridge a year um, to cover that share. I'm, but I'm not going to speak for Brand County, yeah. but I know it may be a difficult sell because in Brand County. They don't even know where Marcus is, uh, and it's always been an easy sell because it's part of the web. Yeah. And once you flag, what is this for twelve thousand or whatever it is, um, mm -hmm. or the Boy Scouts might want a thousand dollars. We turn them down, kind of. So it, what you think can be? A yeah, it's thing. not. Um. Yeah, it's, it's, this has been an exercise from hell. I'll be honest. <laughs> <laughs> It will be an exercise from hell if Rand County doesn't fund 7% and Bacchus closes because the rest won't fund them. Well, or maybe maybe Norfolk would pick it up. I don't know. Like Maybe Norfolk won't fund it. <laughs> Norfolk won't it fund it. <laughs> I'm hoping I have more votes for Norfolk. Yeah. <laughs> maybe more realistic. <laughs> Any other questions for Judy? Okay. Mr. Chair, yeah. just I just Googled this and the, I just found the article. August 23rd, 2019, City Hall Bureau. Um, Doug Ford says Black Creek Pioneer Village won't be shut down. So, that was it. That was it. <laughs> That's pretty profound. All right. <laughs> then I have a motion that the LPRCA Board of Directors direct staff to request feedback from municipal staff on the draft cost apportioning agreement for Category 3 programs and services. Mm -hmm. Prior to its circulation to member municipal, municipal councils for consideration. I have a move in a second there. Stu and Doug. Any further discussion? Just a quick comment, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, <laughs> Robert's dropping out, Stu is dropping out. Uh, I, you know, I just, it could become an issue. Can it mm -hmm. become a real issue? Am I right? Well, it could be an issue, but we're being very, we want to be positive. That we can maybe, you know, provide enough um, information and get senior staff on side that maybe they can help also position it with the council. Well, and like, you know, like, at, you know, there is a lot of people that have attended back as um, school programs, like even at Norfolk County when we had the meeting, uh, you know, it was mentioned that, oh, I, I went I went there as a, a kid in school, right? Like a lot of people have a connection there. And we are trying to broaden um, some Did of the Did you donate programs. when you were there? Did I donate? 
<laughs> um, but like we're tr we're actually giving some schools in Tilsonburg and along the border um, going to back as like a, we're trying to reach. We do have um, some of the contract Christian schools that um, do come also. So we are trying to get as many people attached to that area as we as we can. But. Chris. Thank you, Kevin. Now, fortunately, I'm new at this game, um, and I didn't have to go through the uh, the aggravation for the last two years of these changes in the act. But as I understood it, uh, um, they want to have municipal support for these non-core kind of things. And um, I'm hoping, you know, pretty soon we're going to have a vote that, uh, depending on the vote on this proposal, there's at least core support. Uh, on the concept here that uh, we just want to apportion it as we always have. And you know, if, if everybody around this table agrees with that, then I know that we have a few salesmen when it comes to Grant <laughs> County's. Uh, I will uh, be like a pie piper at Grant County and lead them all this way. <laughs> but, but if there are severe reservations, then uh, you know, we should look at other options. But I'm hoping again that there is support, unanimous support for the proposal as is. And uh, that we can do the sales job to our individual councils. But I'm, I'm, well, I'm hoping that we get four at Norfolk County Council, but I make no guarantees I'm getting unanimous support, support there. So. Well, I hope so too, Chris and uh, board members, that uh, the government has not made things easy for us. Mm -hmm. Like this category one, two, three thing it is, uh, is uh, uh, difficult for us as board members, very difficult for staff. I mean, they have to walk through all this and put this together, and it's it's taken extra work, extra time, which means extra dollars, consequently. So, um, do I need to read a motion? Again? You all heard it. I have a mover and a seconder. Those in favor? That's scary. Thank you. So the next item we have is number ten C, which is a legislative update and comments. E R ERO posting 019-616813. And Leanne, are you going to speak to this? Yes, ma'am. Through the chair, on April 6, 2023, the Ontario government released a proposed new provincial planning statement, which is proposed to combine and replace the existing provincial policy statement and a place to grow growth plan for the greater horseshoe area. The Ontario government posted the new provincial planning statement on the Environmental Registry of Ontario for a 60-day commenting period. Since drafting this report, the province has extended the commenting window for an additional 60 days for a total of 120 days, which ends on August 4th. There are a number of significant changes included in the proposal, and staff have reviewed and provided comments on these sections applicable to LPRCA in the report, and we have provided those comments to the province for their consideration. To summarize our comments, um, one, there was a section of the provincial policy statement that dealt with natural heritage for wetlands and those type of features. It has, the Ontario government has not released this section, and they are saying that it will be contained in the new provincial planning statement and LPRSA will review once those policies and definitions have been finalized. So right now there's a section that's kind of empty and they will be posting that on a separate ERO so to be continued. The natural hazard policies, which LPRCA administers and provides comment on on behalf of the province, there's little change to that. A new policy addition has been made to ensure that planning authorities identify hazardous lands and hazardous sites and manage development in these areas in accordance with provincial guidance. A comment that was brought up to Conservation Ontario and through the other CAs was that the province through the CA Act and through Ontario Regulation 6821, where they have listed mandatory programs and services, they have said that conservation authorities are responsible for mapping of natural hazards <coughs> and confirm that this is a mandatory program. A comment that we would like the province to consider is adding in specific wording in there 
that conservation authorities um, or provide at least a reference to us and that new code to avoid any duplication of effort and promote collaboration between the planning authorities and conservation authorities where they exist in Ontario. That was one comment that we gave. Another one is we've also identified that updating potential tech guides, a lot of them are around 20 years old. And what we have asked, and I believe they're in the work, but a comment that we wanted to provide was that they continue to update these technical guides to ensure that the policies are consistent with best practices. The comments um, that were submitted to the ERO are located on page 70 and 71 of the agenda package. And it basically just formalizes the comments I just went over. Do you have any questions I can answer? Any questions for the end? Seeing none, I have a motion that the LPRCA Board of Directors receives a review of proposed policies adapted from a place to grow, a provincial policy statement to form a new provincial planning policy instrument, and the associate, associated submission with the Environment Registry of Ontario as information. I need a mover in a second. Uh, any further discussion? Those in favor? That's scary. So, oh, two. The audit and finance committee terms of reference. And Aaron, are you going to speak for that? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. So on uh, Thursday, May 18th, uh, the audit and finance committee met and one of the agenda by, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> agenda items was to update the terms of reference for the committee to review. Um, the draft terms of reference can be found in attachment one, um, and the existing terms of reference can be found in attachment two. Uh, the goal of the updated terms of reference for, was for the committee to have, um, have it removed from the personnel policy where it currently resides and to be a separate policy on its own and to have the terms of reference align with the administrative bylaw to make the key documents consistent. Um, the draft uh, audit and finance committee terms of reference uh, includes a purpose section that identifies the objectives of the committee and the composition of the committee, which will remain the same. Um, the committee still is required to meet at least twice annually, once prior to uh, the interim audit and once after the year-end audit it is complete to approve the draft financial statements uh, to go to the board of directors at the AGM. Um, additional meetings of the committee may be called by the chair or by the general manager, secretary, treasurer to ensure that the committee is fulfilling their duties and responsibilities. Um, the roles and uh, the responsibilities of the committee are divided into five categories. Um, they're responsible for the external audit, um, financial investments and other reporting, internal control, compliance, and then there's a general section there that uh, covers up some of the other responsibilities. Um, if there's any questions from the board, uh, through you, what's the rationale for removing the personnel portion? Given the services portion, um, through you, Mr. Chair, the rationale um, one, it was time to update um, the, the terms of reference, but uh, secondly, um, we would like to update the personnel policy and the terms of reference yeah. for the planning I don't think that's oh. no, are you, are you forming two committees? No, sorry. No, but he's asking why are we removing the human resources section that we have never we never had human resources on the finance on the finance. No, it wasn't. So the only the only area we did have, if I may, is uh when we were doing the uh, uh comparators for uh the grids of uh, the salaries and the grids that fell under recommendations under finance. For the pay grid? Yeah. Um, no, annually, um, we didn't review the pay grid um, per se. We took the CPI and we related that to the levy increase. Um, during the budget time, the pay grid was approved by the, at the, bud, at the budget day to go to the board after 30 days of a municipal um, response period. Okay, and, and I'll, I'll agree with that. Uh, 
Well, I'll give you an example here. Who would be doing the performance appraisal for the CAO? What committee? Yes. That was done through finance in the past. No. Um, so the last performance appraisal for the general manager, um, it was done by the chair and the vice chair, and then it came to the board of directors as a whole. As a whole, it wasn't done through finance. No, it wasn't. Okay. I'm sorry to take up that time. I misunderstood. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, I have a motion. Uh, that the audit finance will return to reference part two, section 32 of the LPRCA personal policy to remove and that the draft, draft audit and finance committee terms of reference be approved as presented. I'm going to move her in a second. Mm -hmm. Dave. And Rainey. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, those in favor. That's scary. Thank you. So now we have the education center exterior upgrades. And Judy, you're going to speak to that? And thank you, Mr. Chair. So in this report, um, we're asking the board to consider um, two projects. Um, and they're on the external side of the um, education center down at Bacchus. So um, in the report, we laid out that the work that we have been doing down there and we were able to access some grant funding. So I guess back in 2019, the, the outside repairs started with the roof being replaced and we used um, a reserve that we had on our financial statements um, set aside for the education center specifically. Um, then we also received a grant for enabling accessibility of $96,583. Um, that work has been done. They ins we were able to install a ramp and we electrified the doors, uh, made one door larger. Um, we did two accessible washrooms upgrades, um, took two current washrooms and just reconfigured them putting all the locks and things on that. We did a improvement to the some electrical work was also completed in that uh, tender. And that was managed. Um, we hired Spreed Associates to oversee that because they also um, managed the project here when we, when we put the uh, new washroom in here. And then, um, under the RFP process, PK Construction um, oversaw the work and, and completed that side of the project. So that was completed in 2022. Um, but no, it started in 2022 and we finished it in early 2023. Um, a couple of trailing things that we didn't, we couldn't uh, secure up for the front doors. So then we also applied for funding um, to the Fed Dev, and we did receive 143250 and we did finish that work in March of this year. Um, the money we used, uh, the work that we did there with that funding was we basically upgraded, um, and I, I have some pictures to show you, but we did a new front sign. <laughs> And we did basically the classroom, the boardroom, through the whole center. We did new flooring, new painting, new lights. Um, we painted the rail. We um, put in a glass barrier upstairs, took out all that clunky other apparatus that was there and wasn't functioning. And we put in two glass barriers. Um, we were able to secure a projector and a laptop. We're going to do a projection on the one wall. We moved the geese that were on the one wall to the other wall. We painted the one big mural that was there. I mean, it's um looks like a totally different building with um, all the upgrades that we've done. So uh, as we looked at that, it's like when you do renovations in your home. Um, we always knew that the louvers on the top and all the different 
domers and that when they call them the popolas um, off top, they were deteriorating and were having issues with rodents, red squirrels that like to chew through and they were inside and chewing through the drywall. So um, I could never find anyone that would give us a quote on that. So piggybacking on with having a relationship with PK down there, um, I asked them if they would be interested in quoting and they did because they had managed the other project. Um, and so then technically for the ramp with the rise that we have, we don't need a railing um, to be code, but we feel that a railing would be make it safer because it would be easy to fall off that because there's quite a lift. And in the pictures I tried to show you the, the new um, ramp that's going up to the front door. So the other project, one project is replacing everything on the roof that's deteriorated with aluminum, um, some type of aluminum product and levers and screening so we can keep the rodents out um, and the two end panels on the gable ends. And then the other project is to um, replace the stairs, um, replace the railings that go up the stairs because that has to be towed. Um, and then put a handrail down the ramp and also put the same guard around the top of the landing. Um, right now, if you see in the pictures, there's a, a wooden one that um, that we have at the top of the landing. So this wasn't part of the original project, but we didn't have enough money. And But now there's been more deterioration on the stairs. It's actually crumbling in a couple spots. Mm -hmm. And the stairs really aren't even the right, they're not really code, they're too, sh they're too short and they're steep. So that would bring everything in, that quote would include them managing them and getting the permits required and submitting the drawings to get all that. Um, so the two amounts, um, the one for the the new guard, the steel rail guards, and the elevated for the elevated landing and the ramp, and the um, new stairs, port stairs in place, would be thirty thousand five hundred. And then the other quote is for the existing louvers um, and the flashing around the dormers, and then put some allowances in there too replace any wood that's needed before we cap that off. Um, and the two gable ends, 28,600. And in a total, there's a lot front and back. I, I um, There's the pictures you can see, so I'm just looking to see the exact number. You don't need that number. Yeah, I think there's 18 fronts that we need to replace with the louvers. And I think to save money, um, we have, there's some room to maybe not do louvers everywhere. So we would just maybe do louvers on the front and do solid on the on the sides and the back and just keep the louvers to the front because that would be more expensive and just use a solid product on the sides if possible. So um, yeah, they have to actually get up and measure and then we have to actually fine tune, but that was the best estimate that PK uh, to give, but there's potential bit of savings on the 28600 based on the product that we select. So um, we do have some money still in the reserve, um, $50,880, and that's our internally restricted, and the board can choose how to spend that. And then I'm also suggesting to use um, the remaining $8,220 from the back is with endowment fund, the deferred interest um, revenue that we have. We can, under the agreement, use the interest um, for capital improvements. We have used it for operating the outdoor education programs, but this type of work is also allowed. So um, I wanted to bring it forward to the board to see if we could continue um, because it would really make the project complete um, with the, all the upgrades that we've done inside. We just need to get the outside secured down. Any questions for Judy? Yes, Peter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was at Bacchus on Sunday 
and uh, toured around there. And the louvers are in pretty tough shape. And but you know, I had read this report before I went down. They're not intending to inspect the place, but it. I don't have much of an opinion on the sidewalk, on the railings, on all that sort of thing. But the the twenty eight thousand for the louver shocks me. It really does. That seems to me to be an extraordinary amount for the for the work that needs to be done there. I I find it way overinflated. How many louvers was there all together? You're, you're talking to me about the back of the building has louvers too, but you're talking about doing them differently, right? Yeah, so there's um <clears throat> so there's eight on the dormers, eight on the copolis, and two on the gable ends. So I guess there's twelve. Or I thought there's eight. Oh, it's eighteen, sorry. I can't add. So um, I know it seems like a lot of money and I thought it was a lot of money too, but I've been trying to find somebody even to give us a quote and <laughs> it's been a challenge to uh, nobody wants to do it and um in turn inside, you know, we could, you know, possibly do it, but then you're looking at all the equipment and the safety equipment to get and working at heights, and we have the MOL inspector at the back is, who walks through, like, you would really have to be doing it to code, and I think, um, yeah, just, that, you know, you'd have to rent the proper equipment and things, so that adds up when you have to rent those lifts. But, um, you know, it's up to the board. It's Free to go for the board. Just to clarify, Mr. Chair, my comment was not meant as a criticism of staff or of this report at all. I understand the difficulty well, of trying to get some jobs even to be quoted on, but I think they're they're helping themselves to our checkbook quite liberally. Chris. Well, maybe I when I read the report, it's the movers and flashing, right? It's not just the movers. No, it's also and all the trim the flashing work. around all those. So that's why you never build a house that has dormers on it, because the flashing is a pain. Hard to do it, a lot of times, and you've got a plug up top that uh, <laughs> was not just replacing dormers in that contract, right? Okay. No, it's also yeah. replacing the flashing. Uh, and anytime yeah. you yeah. fix stuff, you use the metric system. Guess what it should cost? Double it now, 32. <laughs> you just about right there. <laughs> Any other questions or comments regarding this? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just wanted to add to what uh, the board member Van Gossen said. I, um, I've had some sort of similar work done on in my house, and, and I found, as I also was you know, a bit shocked at, at the quote that I was given. And uh, I, you know, when I asked for a better explanation, uh, apparently a large part of the cost is the demolition of the existing stuff they have to air out. To make these repairs and, and and the lifts and all those things. So um, while it is a lot of money, I, I think that that's just the way it is. As Councilor Van Hassen said, the metric system it, it works sort of pretty well there. <laughs> Any further? Yes. Are, the, are, are we going to be touring this uh, location on the tour that we're planning? Um, we planning? We could. Yes, we haven't firmed that up. Um, the um the read yet actually i was thinking that if the board wanted we could actually hold a board meeting at that location either in july or september um just so everybody could who hasn't had a chance to visit you have an opportunity to see the facility and the upgrades that we've done today thank you any further questions or comments yes <clears throat> I just want to concur. Um, absolutely. When you're pricing things out nowadays, I know that uh, staff would come back to council and requested more funds because projects that were, were um, costed out a few years ago have now doubled or tripled in price. You know, so when you, you're looking at, uh, you know, Ministry of Labor issues to get lifts in here and the safety issues, all that equipment is going to cost a fortune. The tear, tear out all these dormers, it's going to cost. Absolutely. So 
things are costing yes. a lot more nowadays. Thanks, Shelly. Anyone else? Okay, I've got a long motion here. The LPRSA Board of Directors approves retaining PK Construction Inc. for the replacement of the concrete entrance stairs, new steel rail guards to the elevated landing and barrier free ramp for $30,500. And that the LPRSA Board of Directors approves retaining PK Construction Incorporated for the replacement of existing louvers and flashing around the dormers, cupolas, and gable ends for $28,600. And that the LPRCA Board of Directors approves the use of $50,880 from the Education Center Internally Restricted Reserve and $8,220 for the Backus Woods Down Fund Deferred Interest Revenue. I have a mover in a second. Chris and Peter. Is there any further discussion? A call for the vote. Those in favor. And are there any opposed? That's carried. So we have one last report on the new business. That's the big audit of what's lane mapping study. And the you going to take that? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm here seeing staff issued a request for proposal for the for a consultant to complete floodplain mapping with Big Otter Creek in Tilsonburg and Colton and Dam. Historical floodplain mapping for a portion of this area exists. In, a, in 2020, updated mapping was completed upstream and downstream of this area. The purpose of this project is to compare to current mapping and technical standards floodplain mapping for the Big Otter Creek reach. This mapping will support LPRCA flood forecasting and warning system for the flood prone communities of Vienna and Port Burwell. LPRCA has partnered with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, the Lake Erie Management Unit, for the project, as they are looking to use the information that we would gather during the flood mapping project for their fish habitat studies on this section of the creek. During the 2023 budget process, a budget of 54,000 was approved, 50% funding from LPRCA San Juan Levy, and 50% from MNRM Lake Erie Management Unit. Staff issued the RFP on May 9th, and by the deadline of May 26, LPRCA has received 10 proposals. Each proposal was received, oh sorry, was reviewed and evaluated independently by an assessment team of three staff members on the quality of the proposal, the experience of the consulting team, the approach to the study, the cost, and the schedule. The proposals received are listed on page 84 of your agenda package, along with the price. Based on the results of the independent evaluation, staff recommend that the proposal submitted by Office for Beach be accepted at a price of $51,930, excluding the unrecoverable portion of the HST. The proposal ranks the highest by the assessment team. The firm's experience in administering this project is experience in administering projects of similar size and scope. The firm's proposal included in detail that they would need to meet each deliverable identified in the RFP. Since the approval of the budget, the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, the Lake Erie Management Unit, has been in contact with me and they actually have received $40,000 for the project and they are willing to give that total to us to support this. So that, if we accept and award the contract to offer for each, MNRF would be paying to 76% of the project and LPRCA would fund the balance through the approved. 2023 budget. Staff recommend the board to the board that Aquifer Beach Limited be retained for engineering services to complete the Big Otter Creek Blessing Mapping Study at a cost of $51,930 exclusive of HFT. If you have any questions regarding the staff report, I can answer them for you. Any questions for the end? Okay. I have a motion here that the LPRCA Board of Directors receive the general the general manager report for April 2023 is information. Am I wrong? Yeah. 
No, that's me. That's you. Oh, okay. <laughs> that one. <laughs> Sorry. We're just speaking. Well, it's okay. No, it's okay. You, you got to have a good secretary. <laughs> but the LPRC Board of Directors approved retaining Aquifor Beach Limited for engineering services to complete Big Otter Creek floodplain mapping study at a cost of $51,930, exclusive of HST. Can I have a mover in a second? Rainey and David. Uh, any further discussion? Yes, Robert. I, I'm just curious, Mr. Chairman, uh, if the firm uh, submitting the proposal knew the percentage uh, scoring system prior to submitting their proposal. For example, did they know that 10% was going to be awarded to proposal completely following 21st is seven. Did they know that ahead of time? Through the chair, no, they do not. Peter, you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thought just occurred, like we're looking at a considerable savings from what we had budgeted for this project due to the end and our funding. Um, is there a possibility of shifting some of that budgetary uh, excess over to, say, the Bacchus project? Um, we could um, look at that. Normally what we do is it goes, if it's been approved for like a, a project in the, for dams or for a floodplain mapping and things like that, we just um, put it in a reserve and then at budget time, um, if there's a project where we need matching funds, we've drawn on that. Um, if we have a reserve, it just sits in the capital reserve for future projects. Um, but that would be an option if um, there is savings if the board wanted to do that. We could, once we have a final cost, we could uh, come back to the board with uh, the final, like once I have a final cost on the projects that back in, um, we could bring a report back to the board. And um, if that's something the board wishes. That's satisfying your question. So I bring the motion. I have a mover and seconder. Is there any further discussion? Those in favor? That's carried. So I'm going to uh, recommend we take a five minute break before we go into closed session. I have a motion that the LPRCA Board of Directors is now entering the closed session to discuss the position, plan, procedure, criteria, or instruction. <laughs> to be applied to any negotiations carried out on or to be carried on by or on behalf of the authority. Can I have a move in a second? Rainey and is there any further discussion? Then I'll call for the vote. Those in favor. Okay, we are now in closed session. So, board members, the next meeting is July the 5th, 2023, and this board is now adjourned. Thank you all for your input.